Uh, I'm going to try and explain what I mean by the cultural circuits of capitalism, explain to you how that works, and kind of work my way through to this subject of, of addiction. So over a, a course of a, a, of a couple of books here, uh, first one on virality, right? Uh, that looks at the way that kind of scientific ideas are fed through into this cultural circuit. So I was looking particularly at the way that network science, uh, even starting with people like Milgram, Six Degrees, that kind of stuff, We're going through Duncan Watts, etc. I won't go on too long. Through to memetics, you know, the famous dead uh, science of memetics, and the way that that's translated into kind of ideas around virality. Uh, I've got an actual personal anecdote here. You know, I got an email a couple of years ago from a huge uh, social media company asking me to come down and discuss my book. And I said, well, what can I do? You know, I do kind of social theory and stuff like that. We want you to come and talk about virality stroke growth. And I emailed back and said, I get the virality bit, I don't know what you mean by growth. You know, so that was kind of a, a dead one. Um, the latest stuff is really looking at, we've already been talking about Skinner, but the, the kind of drift from behaviourism, cognitive science, psychology, into neuroscience. I'm particularly interested in working with design students around computing in computer uh, uh, interaction, human-computer interaction. And there's been a real shift there. There's a big emotional turn at the end of that where a lot of HCI people are absolutely fascinated with what they call the third paradigm of uh, HCI, which is really around emotions, affect, feelings, etc. And this leads you on to kind of looking at things like neuromarketing, uh, neuroeconomics, etc. Can I just do it like that? So look, some sort of examples of the way this works. I usually ask my students at the point, does anyone know about the famous, uh, famous, sometimes not so famous, research that uh, Facebook carried out with emotions in 2014? Hopefully most of you do. It's surprising the amount of uh, students particularly, you know, that kind of most of the stuff don't know what's going on. But this is a, you know, a, a, a typical of the kind of uh, cultural circuits where you get kind of corporate interests and university research interests kind of mixed up in these interdisciplinary uh, ways. And this is a, an organisation who published this the article uh, about the research, which is really trying to ensure, trying to uh, uh, create emotional contagion online. So it's a massive interest to in kind of social theorists, uh, the way in which you, know, you might be able to trigger something that we know happens kind of almost in a face-to-face -face way, can you do that online? The, the, the thing about this was that uh, Cornell University got a kind of lot of flack around this, because this is very really kind of unethical research in, sense, in the sense that they ask for no consent whatsoever from uh, people, there's no opt-out. So you've got around, I think the figure was something like 600,000 plus uh, Facebook users unknowingly being manipulated in this way, right, around emotions. And I just found this interesting because, I mean, this is a kind of corporate research university kind of tie-in here. So this organisation you published, uh, which is called uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which I only noticed when I did a lecture the other day, it's penis, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great name for that. So, you know, I, I'll cut this short. I mean, you can probably read that yourself. But what they did really, they've got a common rule they uh, apply in universities and states, which is about people being able to opt out and offer consent, etc. But, you know, to legitimise this research, and I'm glad they published it in the end, of course we all want to know about it, they legitimised it by saying that Facebook had absolutely no obligation to keep to that common rule. So ultimately they just published anyway, and if you read the text there, it gives you a little bit of an idea. So that's an interesting way, I think, in ways which this kind of, you know, corporate research science uh, 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 circuitry starts to work. Another example, you know, well, lots and lots of examples, we discussed some of that here. You yeah, know, there was a big emotional uh, uh, turn in neuroscience, right? The work of Antonio Damasio. One of the things in this circuitry is popular science books. Popular science books are design gurus and their little quirky diagrams that get shown at conferences and everyone picks their mobile phone out and takes a picture, right? So this is kind of like the way a circuitry kind of works in that way. So we've got some kind of nice ideas around science, some interesting ideas around Damasio and, and Joe Ladeau as well when they start talking about emotions driving decisions. Of course, it doesn't take long for a marketeer to realise that decision means purchase intent, right? So this stuff starts pushing away. We uh, get different companies using different things. We'll look at eye tracking, but EEG becomes uh, quite popular in neuromarketing. Uh, this is a nice one. UX design, user experience design. Parts of the brain which we should target. I, the point here is I'm not trying to say that this stuff necessarily works, but it becomes part of the rehearsal of these, uh, these techniques, okay? Some of it will work, some of it won't work. Uh, you know, this is a, a piece of software called um, uh, the Attention Engine, or, uh, it, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a company, that is a company called iMotions. And if you read the text behind their, their work, it's Damasio, okay? It's just talking about how the emotional brain yields decisions, how we're not just rational creatures after all, right? 
Uh, this is Don Norman, who's huge in UX design, worked for Apple, Ford. Uh, this is his quirky little model about the visceral, affective level in which you can kind of appeal to people through brands, etc. Okay, and we've already mentioned a hook up there, which uh, really just takes a very kind of crude. Did you mention hook just now? Takes a kind of crude Skinner kind of a Skinner box model. Okay, so look, the point I'm making the book, and this is a bit boring. This is going back to critical theory. Is that you know I, I actually criticise a particular mode of critical theory, which goes back to kind of Frankfurt School, I guess, and run, runs through media and cultural studies particularly, and that's the kind of uh, theory that tries to create a distance between itself and science. And I think projects like this are absolutely you know crucial because they get involved with scientists who we find are actually human, you know, not just a bubble organisation called Venus. Um, so, you know, I make the huge point here that trying to get up close to science. So throughout my books, you know, good or bad, and I say, I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm just a media theorist. But to try and actually get in and try and understand some of the science and, and, and work with scientists and artists, of course. Okay, so we could still be kind of sceptic and antagonistic, um, but we don't really want to be aloof, right? Uh, as Catherine Howes makes a really good point about uh, the problem with humanities is they don't get involved until later on down the line when things have gone wrong, right? So, you know, it's fine. Okay, so look, resistance is, I'm sure it's my last slide. You know, uh, 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 someone else mentioned this as an article in the Observer. I couldn't believe, you know, someone said about doing this, the book came out, and there's a book launch. Uh, this was, was it in the Observer? Um, a little while ago. And this was talking about the guy who wrote Hooked, how he, you know, he appears in Silicon Valley and tells everybody how he can make these really addictive apps. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting thing, and then you start reading the guy who invented like, or, you know, called Awesome first, actually uh, now blocks all these sort of social media, and, you know, I, 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 I say the book, I've never owned a mobile phone, and I do that very much for that reason, you know, I, I like to, I tell my students are absolutely outraged <laughs> when they find out, but I like to leave the house and have like a private life, you know, until I get back and pop email again, you know, so that being teased out into the public all the time. It's a huge thing, you know, Adam Greenfield talks about it quite well. So, you know, you can block and you can do that. I'm not too sure how, how, how much of an impact that would be on people who are younger than me and won't find it so easy to do. But we, we were talking today, we've had a, a session earlier today with the students, and they're designing things, they're designing apps, that's part of their course. And we were thinking, oh, why don't you try to re-engineer some of this thing? Uh, Theresa Brennan uh, wrote a great book years ago, the late Theresa Brennan, by the way, um, uh, called uh, Transmission of Affect. And uh, she talks about one of the, the, the kind of main thing is we need to educate our senses. Right? Not just the kind of logical sides, we go back to maybe the mass here. idea. But, you know, let's, let's think about, you know, how we can re-engineer these ideas. And I'll just, you know, focus on one of these before I, I, I end. You know, this knowing your triggers, one of the uh, points made in book is that we all have negative kind of, you know, emotions. And I, I think it come across in a lot of the talks today, we're not talking about happy emotions. We're talking about negative anxiety, stress, feeling lonely, and these things like notifications tend to come up and you know, wake us up and we, well, we feel like we're wanted, right? Well, the, the idea that you've got internal triggers, these kind of uh, you know, things that behaviorism wants to get in and, and provide a reward for, you know, maybe it's just a matter of people knowing what they are, becoming a little bit more conscious of what we are, becoming a little bit more conscious of our kind of emotional connection with these things, aside from just our day-to-day -day life in shit jobs. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.